Oh, hi. <coughs> <coughs> Didn't see you there. Hello and welcome back to another Disturbing Book Review, the series where we actually review disturbing books. Sorry for the background noise too, I have to have the fan on or I will die! If you remember, my last review was on the book Through the Eyes of Desperation, the red version. Through the Eyes of Desperation was a collaboration process between two splatterpunk authors, Aaron Beauregard and Daniel J. Volpe. Since we've already read the red version, it only makes sense that we tackle the black version. <laughs> I swear to fucking god I have this book. I don't know where it is. If you have not watched my review for the red version, I would really recommend watching that or at least like finding a summary of the book because in order to review the black version, I'm going to be referencing the red version a lot. And so this video will just make more sense if you know what I'm talking about. I had some preconceived expectations for what this collab was going to be going into reading the black version. And let me tell you, all of my expectations were completely dashed. If you remember, in the red version, there is a character named the Black Widow. She doesn't appear much in the book, but her aura is undeniable. She is the person running Shadow's Casino, she is the head bitch in charge, and she is fucking terrifying. So I went into the black version expecting it to be pretty much the origin story of the Black Widow. I assumed that all of the events would take place before the events of the red version. In reality, both the red and the black version take place during the same period of time. We are watching the same events unfold in both books, just from two different characters' perspectives. The red version obviously is following red, and the black version is obviously following the Black Widow. <laughs> Get it? And of course, just like in the red version, the black version is non-linear. That's right, it's me, future Julia, back again, because as usual, I did not get all the footage I needed the first time I recorded, so you will be seeing me periodically throughout this video. Oh, and I almost forgot my favorite aspect of this collaboration, the gimmicks! I think I've mentioned before, there's nothing I love more than a good gimmick. Both versions of Through the Eyes of Desperation have a very special, exciting gimmick. Both books reach a point where the story stops and you, the reader, are told that you need to get a coin and flip it and whichever side the coin lands on determines which ending you get. Both books have two endings. But before we can get into the ending, we first have to talk about the beginning. And before we get into the beginning, we first have to talk about the trigger warnings. As usual, when it comes to trigger warnings, I just want to say it again, I have enough respect for you, the viewer, to trust that you know your own boundaries. I'm going to read off the triggers for this book, and if any of the things that I mention make you uncomfortable or are going too far, I am trusting you to know your own boundaries and choose not to watch this video. I'll have a much shorter fun video coming out after this one, I swear it. So, trigger warning for the following. Murder, torture, rape, war, PTSD, gore, drug addiction, gambling addiction, vomit, miscarriage, animal abuse, animal death, bestiality, child abuse, child endangerment, child sexual abuse, death of a child, child trafficking, sex trafficking, human trafficking, pedophilia, genital mutilation, coprophilia, or poop stuff, coprophagia, or even worse poop stuff, Italian people, and of course, cringe. If you can handle a video where all of those things are mentioned, then welcome aboard, baby, let's get going. So similarly to the red version, the black version is jam-packed with exposition right at the beginning. This is a very high concept book. So I'm going to, here, take my hands, take my hands. Are you ready? Okay. I am going, sorry, I am going to run through this exposition, okay? I'm gonna go through it all really fast. There's a lot to get through in order for us to get to the actual plot line. We are going to get through it together. You're gonna have to keep up with me, okay? Are you ready? No, are you ready to fucking run with me? Okay, okay, let's begin. Meet Charity Sable, or as we are going to refer to her, C. C's mom is out of the picture and she's been raised pretty much her whole life by her fuck up of a dad named Vin. Vin really does love C, you know, he's trying. I mean, I mean, well, he's trying as much as someone who's also juggling a drug addiction and gambling addiction can try, but he's trying kind of. C has been living in poverty pretty much her whole life because her dad, you know, he's doing his thing. Vin is constantly in and out of debt. 
He spends his time doing drugs and groveling with loan sharks. We learn that it's not an uncommon occurrence for C to be dragged along to whatever shady place her dad is going to to pay off his current gambling debts, which is one of the reasons why C is shockingly calm when her dad takes her to Shadow's Casino. C has seen a lot of shady places in her life, but nothing this gruesome, and she kind of finds it like fascinating and exciting. So Vin, continuing his campaign for Father of the Year, says, all right, I need to go talk to the guy who runs this casino about my gambling debts. So I'm just gonna leave you, my 17 year old daughter, on the main lobby floor of this casino where they kill people for fun. <laughs> this is where we get to learn a bit more about C's personality. She is a pretty proud and combative person, but more than anything, she is still a naive 17 year old girl. Like at one point, a gross old man comes up to her and starts like propositioning her and she like just won't stop engaging with this. Like this guy is obviously a threat to her and she just like can't stop herself from talking back to him. Things escalate really fast in this conversation until, hey, what's going on over here? Meet Marty. Marty is this big hulking bulldog of a man and he is the head of security at Shadow's Casino. He breaks up this interaction and is like, hey, are you Vin Sable's daughter? You gotta come with me to the back office. As they're walking to the back room, Marty is like, you really shouldn't be engaging with creepy old men like that. Like that was a dangerous situation you were in. And C's just like, don't worry, I can handle myself. If anything, you save that guy some trouble because I was about to kick his ass. And he's like, okay. So anyway, Marty leads C to this back room where she sees that her dad has had the shit beaten out of him basically. The only other person in the room is this grinning old man named Gianni. Oh fuck. <laughs> More Italian representation. <laughs> we learn Gianni is the head of Shadow's Casino. He's the guy running it. He's the guy who Vin owes a lot, a lot, a lot of money to. And he is also fucking scary. Not only did he beat the shit out of Vin, the second that C walks in the room, Gianni is immediately making like disgusting comments about like how she smells and what he's gonna do to her and stuff and like, he knows that she's 17 by the way C of course is like oh my gosh dad what's going on and dad is like <laughs> I got beat up Gianni then explains to C your dad owes me a lot of money like a lot a lot of money like more money than he's ever owed someone before and it's the end of the line. It's time for your dad to pay up. No more promises, no more gambles, no more IOUs. However, I do know that there's no fucking way that your dad is going to get this money for me. So, your father and I are going to do one final gamble. And he takes out a poker chip that is black on one side and red on the other. Is this sounding familiar? Gianni tells C, your father has agreed to this bet. It's all set in stone. I'm gonna flip this chip and he's gonna call the color that it lands on. If he guesses right, then everything's happy. You're free to go, the debt is paid, you're all good. But if he guesses wrong, then I get you as payment. Father of the year, Vin Sable, everybody. Best dad ever, oh my God. So without another word, Gianni flips the coin, her dad calls the color and it's wrong. And just like that, C is now property of Shadow's Casino. Thanks Vin. After he loses, Gianni like continues to beat the shit out of Vin. Most notably putting an ice pick into his spinal cord, paralyzing him from the legs down. So after that all is done, guess what? C is sexually assaulted by Gianni. There's a lot of sexual violence in this book, like way more than in the red version. And so every time there's an instance of sexual violence, instead of like playing it up for shock value, I'm just gonna say, and then it happens. And this will appear on screen. So yeah, it happens. Uh, C, the 17 year old is sexually assaulted by this scary old man who she now belongs to. We fast forward two years in the future and we learned that for the past two years, C has been working as a dealer on the main casino floor, and she's actually been kind of thriving. <laughs> like I said, before she was even brought to Shadow's Casino, she was already kind of a messed up kid, and she has like a morbid curiosity for really dark, gruesome things. And that actually has made her like one of the best dealers at Shadows. We also see that Marty's still here. Marty has kind of taken C under his wing as like almost a father figure. Some of my favorite writing in this whole book is the dialogue between Marty and C. It's really natural 
channel. I like the writing for both of their voices. They just have this natural chemistry between them. These conversations don't just help with characterization. They also give us some insight into shit that's going on at the casino. For example, C and Marty are talking about the latest violent thing that's happened at the casino. I know, shocking, right? Violence occurs here. We learned that for the past while that C has been working here, things have kind of slowly been going off the rails with Gianni. Now, Gianni has always been sadistic. That's nothing new. But he has been getting more and more paranoid and arbitrary with his sadism. More and more over the past few years, his mind has been going and he's making more and more decisions that make no fucking sense, including accusing his own employees of things with little to no proof and then just killing them or more specifically torturing them to death over it. I mean, this is relatable, right? We've all had a boss that just sucks and that we don't like. And so naturally, uh, C has been going around to the other employees trying to convince them to help her assassinate Gianni. <laughs> we learn this through her conversation with Marty as they're talking about like the latest, you know, person who got it at the hands of Gianni. She's like, hmm, yeah, that's, that's a shame. It's almost like someone should do something about it. <laughs> As soon as she brings this up, Marty shuts her down immediately. He kind of snaps at her. He's like, no, see, I told you before, it's not happening. So stop bringing it up before you get in trouble. Like almost immediately after this conversation, C gets a request on her radio to come into Gianni's office. So she goes to Gianni's office and sure enough, it happens. He sexually assaults her again in this especially gross and humiliating way. And before he sends her back out of his office, he makes a big deal of like getting up in her ear and being like, remember, see, the walls have ears and I know everything that goes on here. Now get out. <laughs> this is both a threat to see and world building for us, the readers. Every room in Shadow's Casino is bugged to the teeth. There are cameras everywhere. There are microphones everywhere. Nothing that anyone says or does is going to get past the people in charge. Meaning that Gianni has absolutely heard C talking about wanting to kill him. So C marches right out of Gianni's office and goes up to Marty and Marty sees right away that something is wrong. And he's like, oh my gosh, what happened? And C is just like, we are killing Gianni tonight. <laughs> like, girl, what the fuck happened to the walls have ears? And it gets even more absurd because she's like, whether you help me or not, I am going to kill Gianni. Are you in? And Marty's just like, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Marty, you are the most easily influenced person on the planet. Whatever happened? Bitch, like whatever happened to, it's not gonna happen. Stop bringing it up before we, you get us both in trouble. What fucking changed? So sure enough, that evening they lie to Gianni and are like, hey, come into the murder room with us. And it's not even just Marty who's agreeing to do this. He gets like a bunch of other security guards to just like help with this assassination attempt. C has got to be like the most persuasive person on the planet. So C and her ragtag group of armed guards lure Gianni into the red room, which is where the most horrifying punishments happen at Shadows. Gianni gets in there and he's like, wait a minute, what the fuck's going on? And C is like, you're done Gianni, we are murdering you now. <laughs> so there's like a bit of a struggle, but C basically commands her army of security guards to strap Gianni into this like torture table that they have in there. Again, I don't know when she got promoted or why everyone's following her like she's the boss, but whatever. And at first Gianni is like kind of trying to talk his way out of this. He's like, look, we can forget about all of this. Uh, Marty, let me out of here. You'll be promoted. We can all just move on. And he's getting nowhere with that because as he's monologuing, C is like monologuing back at him. Like you were in a position of power, you were living the good life and you could have kept that going for years, but you started turning on the people below you and the people who have done nothing but serve you this whole time. And that's why you're gonna pay, baby. So she gets him strapped on this table and of course, cuts his penis off, ooh, and she's beginning to skin him. She's beginning like this whole torture process. And so when it's clear to Gianni that he's not gonna talk his way out of this, he basically drops the act and says to C, you don't fucking get it. There are a lot of people way more powerful than me, way more sadistic than me, who have a lot of money invested in Shadows and invested in me running Shadows Casino. If they find out that you killed their investment, they're gonna be coming after you and they're gonna fuck you up worse than I ever could. 
You can kill me, but you will never see the light of day again. You are never going to escape Shadow's Casino. And C basically responds by being like, D -d 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 I'm Gianni. <laughs> I have a lot to say about this. We will talk more about this later. She has him skinned, he dies, and that skin is what we see displayed on the cover of the book. C is automatically promoted to CEO of Shadow's Casino, and that skin serves as a reminder to everyone not to fuck with her. So then we jump three years into the future. This is now current day. This is the time period in which the events of the Red Version take place. C has been successfully running Shadows for three years and she now has the nickname, The Black Widow, because she kills people. Oh. So this is where I struggle a bit with how to organize this video because from here on out, most of the events of the book are exactly the events of the Red Version, just from the Black Widow's perspective. And so I don't want to go through and summarize the whole thing again, since, you know, we already went through that. This review is going to be a lot more review than summaries. We're going to take a pause on the plot, and I'm going to talk about some of the aspects of the book that I like and that I don't like. Let's start with the things that I liked about this book. Let, let's have some positivity. Come on, guys. One detail of the Black Widow that is never referenced in the Red version, and I'm so glad I know it from the Black version. Guys, the Black Widow is a lesbian! Unfortunately though, she's like a mean fucked up lesbian. Aww. And I don't even just mean like, oh, she's rude to men who hit on her or anything. No, I mean like she's mean to women. So, oh, you know, she's like the Sedona oh, Prince of, <laughs> the Sedona Prince of Shadow's Casino, like the mean scary lesbian. So if you, in case you don't remember, there is a part of the casino known as the dollhouse. It's basically a strip club slash brothel where people can go to do sex stuff between games. And um, all the women in the dollhouse are enslaved there. So that's dark. C is not a girl's girl at all. Like not only did she keep the dollhouse, in shadows after she came into power, like she's keeping up this like sex trafficking gambit. She also targets different women of the dollhouse. Like she'll choose one of them and then have them like sent up to her room where she can like have very like scary sex with them. A lot of the women of the dollhouse are disabled because of like, you know, the violence that they've endured. One of them named Porsche, I think, Portia, Porsche. Porsche has like an oxygen tank and a mask that she wears all the time. C calls her up to her room and it happens. C has very abusive sex with Portia that actually results in her dying. And we learn that this is not the first time that C has done something like this to one of the girls from the dollhouse. Oh fuck, that, <laughs> that, that was one of the positives that I had about this book. Okay, let's get back on track for more like actual positivity. One of the things that I loved about this book, I was tickled pink while reading it. Daniel J. Bulb, I think, did a really good job with this collab, incorporating like Easter eggs and elements of the red version into his version that just like seamlessly combined them. When I was reading the black version, I stopped multiple times and was like, ah ha ha, because I realized that it was a really clever integration with the red version. There's a lot of moments in the red version that I never brought up in my review because they're so like fast and subtle that I, I just didn't think they were relevant at all. But I found out when reading the black version that those were all like little Easter eggs hidden within both books. Like for example, in the red version, when Red goes to the dollhouse with Lily, there's just an offhand comment about an oxygen tank in the corner of the room. And I didn't think anything of that because like I said, a lot of the women in the dollhouse are disabled. It's not that surprising that there'd be an oxygen tank there. When I read the black version, I learned that C had Portia's oxygen tank placed in the dollhouse as like an intimidation tactic to remind all the women like what she can do to them. Remember in the red version, we met Lily. She is like the helpful, nice sex worker in prison here at Shadows who like kind of becomes companion to Red for a bit of the story. And then she dies horribly, of course. At one point, Red straight up asks her like, I mean, I've been telling my life story. What's your, what's your story? And she's just like, I just, I just, I just, I just. <laughs> well, in the black version, we actually get to know Lily's backstory. Lily 
similar to C, came from a pretty rough upbringing and she ran away from home very young. For a time of her life, she experienced homelessness, which also left her victim of sexual assault and physical assault and of course the harsh conditions of living outside. And so she turned to sex work as a form of survival. She got in contact with this guy, Day Day, who she didn't know at the time was the kind of manager of the dollhouse at Shadows. He basically convinces her to come to the dollhouse to do sex work there. He conveniently leaves out all the details about what kind of place Shadows is. And it's only once she gets there that she realizes, oh fuck, this is very dangerous. But at that point, it's too late. And Lily is actually one of the enslaved ones. One of the things that sets Lily apart from the other enslaved employees at Shadows is the fact that she is not a gambler. Once workers finish their shift and get off the clock, they're allowed to roam the rest of the casino. They can do the drugs at the buffet, they can gamble, they can drink, whatever. And that's what a lot of the enslaved employees tend to do. Lily is not a gambler. And this kind of makes her stand out like a sore thumb to the Black Widow. The Black Widow, being the ultimate manipulative psychopath she is, hates this about Lily. Lily can't be controlled and manipulated like most of the other employees. Like remember when I said C is not a girl's girl? This is, I mean, she's really not a girl's girl. The Black Widow sees Lily as this little goody two-shoes, holier than thou, oh me, I could never gamble, little sweet angel. And she takes that personally. Like there's a bunch of details that are really major in the black version, but in the red version, they just appear as like a set piece, like a little detail of the background. It's so cool. I really, really like the way he did that. Like I said earlier, another thing that I really like about this book is uh, Marty and C's relationship. These characters have such good chemistry. I wish that this book had even more of their interactions together. We really get an understanding of like the politics of the casino through the way that Marty and her talk about everything that's going on. I think they have a really natural chemistry and we get the most characterization of C through her interactions with Marty. At one point, her and Marty are just sitting watching the security cameras and she takes out the poker chip. She kept the one that was used to sell her to the casino and she just always has it on her. She's like flipping it and then being like, Marty, you wanna guess? Like, you wanna call it? Even though she hates gambling addicts, she still has that same like risk-taking, dopamine-seeking behavior that her father had. Even though C's behavior and treatment of the other women trapped in shadows is abhorrent, I do think that Daniel J. Volk did a good job with her characterization because I can see why she acts this way to the other women. C has never really had a major female relationship in her entire life. Her mom was out of the picture when she was growing up. We learned through a flashback that when she was in school, she didn't have any friends. She was getting bullied by the other girls. And so of course it doesn't like justify it, but it does kind of explain why C has these like hateful, misogynistic views of women. Oh, my favorite connection between the two books. Remember when I was reviewing the Red version, I kept making jokes about how Red was like the manic pixie dream girl of Shadow's Casino. How every time he interacted with anyone, they're like, you know, there's something special about you. I can't put my finger on it, but you're just different. <laughs> In the black version, we actually get like kind of an explanation as to why that happens. C spends a lot of her time sitting in front of the security cameras, watching everything that's going on in the casino. And so she sees Red pretty early on. Like there's a conversation between Red and Lily that takes place in the dollhouse where he basically explains his life story. He's like, my daughter was missing. I haven't seen her in years. I'm paying this private investigator to try to find her. But now my mom is stuck with these two Italian guys. Initially, she's just listening to this conversation because she hates Lily and is looking for more reasons to hate her. Yeah. But. Then when she hears Red's life story, that really catches her interest. And it's easy to see why when you remember that C was like sold into slavery by her father. Listening to Red talking about his life and his situation has her reminiscing on her relationship with her father and her experience in shadows and the way that she wishes she had a dad who wouldn't have done something like this to her. And that's why of all the other people in the casino, Red catches her attention. It's not like a manic pixie thing. She doesn't find him like special for no reason. There is a very specific reason why she finds him so intriguing and so important. Important. And it only makes sense that if the top dog in charge shows a startling amount of interest in one patron, that all of the other employees would kind of catch on to this and start paying special attention to him too. I don't know if I'm explaining that super well, but 
It's one of my favorite details of the book. In the red version, the way that Red was getting special treatment stuck out like a sore thumb to me and was so illogical. I fucking love that in the black version, they're explaining why everyone in there is paying so much special attention to him. Even if it's not totally logical, I love it. I think that's super fun. This is one of the areas where I think the format of this being part of a collab really succeeds and it really makes it worth it to read both of the books because you get information from both of them that like, I don't know, makes it a better story. And finally, uh, one of the other elements that I liked about this book that I think was done well, Daniel J. Bolt definitely ate with this. One of the aspects of her characterization that I really did like was the way that she is similar to and different from Gianni. Now C, of course, hates Gianni. This is the guy who bought her as a child who sexually abused her. Like she hates him. She's happy that she's the one who killed him. However, as the book goes on, it becomes clear that she also, in a sick way, kind of idolizes him. At multiple points in the book, C will be watching some depravity taking place. Like someone is losing one of the cruel, unfair games and they're being like cut apart for it. And as she's watching this, she's like, ah, Gianni was kind of brilliant setting it up like that. She has this like intrusive thought in her head praising Gianni for his sadism. I don't know if there's a name for this trope, but this is something that already exists. Uh, it's basically when there's a character who just fucking hates someone else. They hate the things that they do, the way that they act, all that, blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, they, whether they know it or not, are displaying a lot of the same characteristics as the person that they hate. She hates Gianni for his greed and his sadism and his selfishness. He sexually abuses people, he abuses his own employees, this, that, and the other. And yet, she is abusing her employees. She is sexually assaulting women from the dollhouse and then like leaving trophies of her victims in the dollhouse to try to like intimidate them. She is desperate for power and she's desperate to be feared and respected. And in her quest to accomplish that, she is acting exactly like Gianni. And this isn't a secret either. Like all of the characters are noticing this happening. I really like it when a character's personality is their fatal flaw. I like it when characters are contradictory and illogical and hypocritical because that's how people act in real life. The most disgusting and unlikable elements of the Black Widow are the elements that make her the most human. This book is full of those elements and I love it. I'll never get sick of that. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things that I really didn't like about this book because unfortunately there were quite a few. Like I said, both these books are part of a collaboration. Of course, they're gonna be intertwined. Of course, they're gonna have similar elements. There's this one thing in the Black version that I have a problem with, but this is also in the red version. I just didn't know it when I first read it. And so now I have a problem with this other book I already read. It's basically that there are chunks of the book that are repeated almost word for word in both books. This conversation between Lily and Red that the Black Widow is like listening in on when Red is kind of introduced to her, that dialogue is repeated almost word for word in both books. There's a few differentiating factors and whatever, but I won't lie, the same dialogue being in both books definitely kind of bothered me. It's not like a short couple sentences either. It's this like pretty important big conversation. Here I am sitting here reading shit I already read. And this is not Daniel J. Bulb's fault. If I read the black version first, I would have the same problem when reading the red version. I'd be like, what the fuck, why I've read this before. This happens in a few other places too, where like pretty significant chunks will be exactly the same in both books. And whether it's justified or not, that irritated me. Another thing that bothered me was the logistics and implications of some of the details of Shadows. Remember right when Gianni was getting killed, he drops that like bombshell of information where he's like, there are a lot of people outside of this casino who have a lot of money invested in me and how I'm running it. When I first read that, my jaw dropped. I was like, holy shit, that's such good world building. Upon reading the red version, I was under the implication that whoever is running Shadows is like the top dog, like the most powerful person in this situation. But then in the black version, we learned that that's not fucking true. Whoever is running Shadows is just one part of this much 
bigger, darker machine. There's these faceless, shadowy people outside of the casino who have money invested in how it runs. That's so interesting. And it also adds an extra layer of conflict for whoever is running shadows. They are not the top dog. They have someone who they need to answer to. That adds so much like stress and tension to everyone's position. This is such genius world building and there's so many directions I could have gone with it. And yet, they choose to go nowhere with it. So yeah, after learning about these evil faceless investors who have more power than anyone, C kills Gianni, and then we fast forward like three years in the future, we get this like bullshit offhand explanation where it's like C at first was nervous that these investors would be mad at her for killing Gianni, but apparently she just was running Shadow's Casino so well that it was like making more money than it did before. And so the investors were like, no, eh, it's okay. <laughs> It's fine. <laughs> Apparently these bloodthirsty, sadistic, wealthy people are really fucking forgiving. Oh, I hate it. It's, I've never seen a bigger wasted opportunity for something that could have been so fucking cool. All of the conflict that could have come from these investor characters is just out the window and they're like never mentioned again in the whole book. Why even bring them up in the fucking first place? Also, just hypothetically, if I was an evil person who had like money invested in a torture casino, I'm not in real life, I'm just hypothetically. And I found out that the person who's running my murder casino Bruh. has been assassinated and replaced Bruh. by a fucking teenage girl. Even if she was making more money than he was, I would still be kind of upset about that, you know? And like, put the profits to the side. This isn't about money, it's about security. If I found out that it was this easy to assassinate the person who's running my murder casino that I have presumably a lot of money invested in, I would be pretty pissed. Like, why was my prize money maker that easy to kill? Like, where is my insurance? And also, it really doesn't fucking matter to me if his replacement is really good with money and oh, business is booming, profits are soaring. Because who's to say that she doesn't get assassinated like next week? I'm just saying, if I was one of these shadowy investors, I would consider pulling my money out of shadows because it seems like a very unstable business model. Uh, but no, in the book, everyone is totally fine with the CEO getting pff, killed and skinned and this 19 year old girl replacing him. Oh, and while we're on the topic of this hostile takeover that C did, let's talk about probably the biggest problem I have with C as a character. And that is the question of why is she so powerful? I know I was explaining it in like a comical way when she was like, Marty, we're gonna go kill Gianni. And he was like, <laughs> All right, let's do it. But really, that moment is so irritatingly nonsensical. Why the fuck would Marty agree to go along with this assassination when like a minute ago, he very firmly stated that he does not fuck with the idea of assassinating the person in power. And never before or after this point in the book is Marty shown to be like impulsive or having bad judgment. So it just, it makes no fucking sense why he would go along with an idea this rash. And I don't need like a big profound answer to that question. I just want an answer. What was it about that moment that caused Marty to change his mind? And considering that so much of this book is dedicated to the characterization of the Black Widow, it really wouldn't have taken that long or been that out of place to establish like what it was that C did to get him on her side. I mean, right before this interaction, C had just been sexually assaulted by Gianni. Did Marty know this? Did he feel guilty that this happened to her? Did he feel sympathy for C? He decided like, you know what? Enough is enough. I don't want Gianni to hurt her anymore. Or is C just so persuasive and so convincing that she said something that won him over? We could add more dialogue of her like saying the right things to reason with him, to get him to go along with her plan. Like maybe Marty wanted C to take over power. Maybe she promised him better conditions or a better promotion or something. Or was he scared of her? Throughout both books, we see that the Black Widow strikes fucking fear into the hearts of anyone who knows about her. Maybe Marty had seen this brutality from her before and she did something to intimidate him into going along with her plan. Those were all just three ideas that I got off the top of my head. In the book, we get none of those explanations. C is just like, we are killing Gianni, and Marty's like, okay. <laughs> this leads me to my next point, and probably my biggest problem that I have with C and her characterization is that she's not nearly as scary as I thought she'd be. Like I said, in the red version, She's not in the book much. She only shows up like a time or two, but every time she does, it's so 
powerful. Like, she's so fucking scary that everyone just kind of freezes up around her. In the black version, I don't get that impression. In fact, it seems like she's less intimidating and more kind of annoying. <laughs> like I said, I like a lot of C's characterization as far as her personality goes, but when it comes to making her like an intimidating character, I think that needed more work. Okay, this is gonna sound like a weird tangent, but stick with me, I promise I'm going somewhere with this. There's another literary character that has the same characteristics as C, but I think is done a lot better, and that is Alex DeLarge of the book A Clockwork Orange. A Clockwork Orange takes place in the future in like a dystopian England, or as I like to call it, normal England. <laughs> Our main character, Alex DeLarge, is the leader of this gang of delinquents who goes around committing ultraviolence for fun, basically committing any cruel, sadistic act they can because they find it entertaining. Similarly to the Black Widow, Alex is a young person in an unusual position of power. He is the leader of the gang he's in, despite being the youngest member of it. Both of these characters are desperate to be respected and taken seriously. Both of them commit horrible acts of violence for their own entertainment. Both of them commit sexual violence. Where these characters differ is that while reading the Black version, I found myself multiple times asking the question, what is it about C that's supposed to be so intimidating? When reading A Clockwork Orange, I never once asked that about Alex. The reason why Alex holds this position of power despite being so young is quite simply because Alex is fucking scary. Everyone who interacts with him is noticeably nervous. Every adult he interacts with is uncomfortable around him. His parents are scared of him. They let him get away with whatever he wants. There's this brilliant moment where the other gang members have this like meeting with Alex where they're basically like, hey, so um, we were thinking, uh, me and the guys were thinking like maybe uh, sometimes one of us could make one of the decisions. Like not all of them, no, <laughs> you'd make most of them still, but just like every now and then one of us could decide what we do. I mean, we, we are all older. <laughs> I mean, and if you don't want it, that's fine too. It was just like something that we were like wondering because a lot of us have been wondering it. Sure, we could do that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, see, I, I told you guys, Alex is like, he's so rational about this. Of course he'd hear us out. Alex, you are the, you are the best. You won't regret this at all. And then immediately following this scene, Alex jumps all three of the other members of the gang who are older than him. He takes them on three on one and he fucking wins. Alex has this position of authority because he took it and he wouldn't take no for an answer. That's how you write a really commanding, intimidating character. Whereas with C, I feel like it was never explained or at least never explained super well why she got this position of authority, why everyone just accepted her as the new CEO of Shadows. Like, yeah, she killed the last guy, but she did that with the help of like five armed guards. It wasn't like she took him down in one-on-one. -on -one. And don't get me wrong, in the black version, all of the patrons of the casino are still terrified of her. They are absolutely scared of her. But the other employees of the casino don't really seem to be scared of her at all. They talk about her the way that you talk about any boss who's like an asshole. <laughs> Probably the best example I can think of for showcasing that C is not as scary or intimidating as I thought she was going to be is at one point we get a scene of the women in the dollhouse. Like they're in the dressing room, they're just chatting or something, and they hear that Lily is in trouble. Like she was given some specific job and she fucked it up somehow. As the girls are talking about how they're worried for Lily because the manager of the dollhouse is gonna be mad at her, one of the women, Akari, who, keep her in mind, we are going to be talking about her more later. Akari says, if I were Lily, I'd be more worried about the Black Widow, that fucking bitch. Another one of the girls pointing at the cameras is like, don't say that, she can hear you. And Akari's just like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> it's like the women of the dollhouse are the most in danger of suffering the Black Widow's wrath. And even they can't be brought to give a fuck about her. One of the- <laughs> So the black version has a lot more world building around the casino itself, which makes sense because the main character of the story is the one running the casino. A lot of the world building has left me very confused. For example, when reading the red version, I was under the impression that all of the employees at Shadow's Casino were enslaved in some way or another. Like either they lost too many bets 
or maybe they got sold there, like seeded or they were trafficked. One way or another, I just assumed that in order to work in a place like this, you had no ability to leave. Turns out that's fucking wrong. <laughs> well, yes, some of the employees are enslaved there. Some of them aren't. Like some of them just are regular employees. Like they clock in, they do their shift, and then they get to clock out and go home at the end of the day. That alone is so much more insane than the implication that every employee here is a slave. Like we learn a good amount of the employees who are enslaved used to be regular employees. They fucked up somehow, they got in too much debt and that's how they became enslaved. One specific example we're given of an employee who used to be regularly employed but then slipped up and became enslaved is Shanice. When she was first hired, she was a bartender. Shanice also happened to enjoy gambling. She was really good at this game specifically because she cheated. She used loaded dice so that she would always get a good number. When she tried cheating at Shadows, she was quickly caught because, you know, cameras everywhere. And as punishment, the Black Widow had her roll three real dice to determine how many teeth she would have knocked out of her head. Once she's had her teeth knocked out, she's informed that she's no longer a bartender. She is now property of Shadows and enslaved at the dollhouse. But, <laughs> But she's not told that. Let me quote exactly what the Black Widow says. You don't work for me anymore, C told her as Janice lay on the floor in a pool of blood and shattered teeth. I own you now. Tomorrow, bring that juicy ass to the dollhouse. I'm starting to wonder like, is C a lesbian? Cause I don't think any lesbian would talk like this. This piece of information opens the door to so many fucking questions. And here are just a few of them. How, how does one become employed in a place like this? What is the job interview process like for Shadows Casino? Uh, do you have to apply? What kind of things do you have to have on your resume? What kind of experience do you have? Do they mention in the interview process that if you fuck up, you might get enslaved in your workplace? What's the pay like? Is the pay good? Do you get breaks in your shift? Uh, how many breaks? For how long? What does the break room look like? What kind of benefits do you get by working at Shadows? And if I become enslaved, will I still get those benefits? If it were me writing this story, I would not have opened that can of worms because then for the rest of the book, I was just constantly thinking about that. Every time we hear any mention of any employee, my mind immediately went to like, are you, do you get to go home? Or are you one of the, you know? So this is one element of the Black Widow's character that I truly desperately wish we got to dive into a bit more because it is so fucking funny. Shadow's Casino is a lot more than just a casino. It's also the dollhouse, it's the buffet, it's the theater. And in the theater, apparently they have shows every single night, which is like fucking insane when you think about it. And throughout the book, we hear that C is very, very excited because she got an act reserved for the theater on this one night that she's really been wanting for a long time. Calypso the Cunning and his lovely assistant, Dead Betty. What is their act? They are essentially a horror core stunt based magic show, which is a criminally underrated form of entertainment if you ask me. And it turns out the Black Widow is like their number one fan and getting them reserved for the theater was like a really big deal. Like the whole bit of this magic act is that Calypso the Cunning killed Dead Betty horribly in every act only for her to come back in the next act. And it's like, oh, that's the magic is that they made it look so real, but she didn't actually die. Which considering that this is taking place in a casino where people actually die for real constantly, um, it's, it's a choice, I guess. But then in the very last act, they bring out a second assistant and this assistant, they kill for real and apparently the second assistant is like a really big deal like C had a specific woman flewed out to Shadows Casino to be the one who gets killed which again considering that people get killed all the fucking time here why does it have to be a specific special person why can't you just choose any person <laughs> to be the second assistant whatever because C hates Lily she put Lily in charge of keeping an eye on this second assistant like making sure she doesn't get into trouble or anything or die or whatever before the show um of course she dies horribly Bruh. Lily turns her back for a second and then turns around and the second assistant has died horribly and now she's in really really big trouble oh and of course Lily also walks in on someone having sex with her dead body because it's splatterpunk the news gets back to see that the second assistant has died you know before she was supposed to die Bruh. and she's like oh that dumb bitch Lily I fucking knew she was gonna fuck this up somehow God, 
Man, unfortunately the show must go on. If only there was another person who should be the second assistant. Shocker of all shockers, she chooses Lily to be the new second assistant. You know, the one who actually dies for real. So the show begins and C is loving it. She is, this is everything she ever hoped it would be. If you remember in the Red version, around the time of the magic show, Red, who had been sober for a long time, relapsed on heroin and cocaine and like every other drug. And so he's kind of tripping out. So as we're nearing the last act of the show, from her place in the balcony, the Black Widow sees the doors open and who stumbles in? It's Red. And she can see very clearly that he is having a bad trip. He's tweaking, he's twitching, he's nodding off, like he's going through a lot. And the Black Widow is like, I hate this junkie bitch. <laughs> and she has this like, unbearably high and mighty moment of internal dialogue when she's watching him like this. And she's like, looks like he went back to his old ways. What a disappointment. Bitch! Like watching him relapse and be at the lowest point of his whole life has reminded her of how much she hates addicts. And she's like, oh, what a piece of shit, just like my dad. Bruh. As if she's not the one who made the conscious decision to keep the free buffet of drugs in the casino at all times. Hell, at one point in the story, she straight up says to a crowd of people, I would just like to remind you all, the buffet is open. Like she so clearly is baiting people, encouraging people to do as much drugs as possible. But then if anyone does drugs, she's like, <sighs> you know, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. So anyway, the time finally comes for Lily to die horribly. They have the whole bit of oh, Lily getting into this wooden box and they're like, I will now saw my lovely assistant in half. Except instead of a fake saw and a magic trick, they use a real chainsaw and they cut her in half from the bottom up. And it goes on for pages, pages and pages and pages describing this process. And once the act is over, C is like, Yay! Like, she's had a great time tonight. Marty asks C, did she really deserve that? And C is like, what are you talking about? She almost ruined the whole show. She was supposed to be keeping an eye on the assistant anyway. Marty's just like, okay, and turns away. But C notices the last glint in his eye as he looks at her is exactly the same way he used to look at Gianni when Gianni started going off the rails. Like I said, the parallels between Gianni and C are no secret. They're not like a subtle hidden thing that you'd need an AP English class to notice. It's very on the nose, but I still like the parallels existing here, especially considering Marty is like C's best friend, kind of her only friend. The fact that even he is seeing her as the monster Gianni once was, it's it's good, it's kind of tasty. I think it's time we got to the moment everyone's been waiting for, the endings. Just like the red version, the black version has two endings. One where red wins the final coin toss and one where he loses. I was wondering how they were going to do this. Like if we were going to find out which ending was canonical, like did red actually get the good version or the bad version? Or if the two endings of the black version were just going to be the two endings of the red version from the Black Widow's perspective. To keep it as surprising as possible, if you want to read the book yourself, I'm not going to be saying which ending, the red or the black, is which ending that I'm about to describe. But if you were wondering, like I was, if there was going to be a good and bad ending, it really depends on what your definition of good and bad is. <laughs> Let's start with the ending that I got, which I have called the hose mad ending. In this version, sure enough, the Black Widow says, pick a color, flips it, Red chooses wrong, Bruh. and he is, just like he was in the Red version, brought over to be one of the new enslaved employees of Shadow's Casino. Okay, exactly what I thought it was gonna be. It's just the same endings as the Red version, but from the Black Widow's perspective. But then, after Red is dragged off to begin his new life as an employee slave of Shadow's, we jump to the living quarters of the women in the dollhouse. A bunch of them have gotten off their shifts, they're getting ready for bed, and they're talking. Word has spread quickly about Lily's horrible death and about how she was pretty obviously set up by the Black Widow to fail so that the Black Widow would have an excuse to kill her. And Lily was very popular with all the women of the dollhouse. Like she was kind of naive, but she was a really nice person. No one had anything bad to say about her. They're all in agreement that she didn't deserve that. And they finally move to the topic of, it could be any of us next. C is obviously power tripping. She's been power tripping for a while. She gets off on hurting women in the dollhouse, specifically to cause fear amongst the other women. She could kill any of them next, just like how she killed Lily, just like how she killed Porsche, just like how she killed countless other women before them. And Akari, remember her? She's kind of leading the conversation. Akari is the first one to say, you know, 
It's almost like someone should do something about this. A hush fell over the room, and all the women of the dollhouse agree that someone ought to do something about the Black Widow, but they also know that there's not a lot they can do, because C always has that fucking army of armed guards led by Marty around her. That's when Akari says, I have a plan. This plan of Akari's is so fucking ridiculous. That it just might work. Basically, they orchestrate a situation where there's going to be a big fight in one of the bedrooms of the dollhouse. <laughs> one of the Johns is provoked to get mad and start being violent with one of the girls. This is, of course, caught on camera. The CCTV people are like, send in the security. And, of course, because this is a splatterpunk book, their plan, <laughs> their plan has a crucial step to it that involves someone shitting themselves. <laughs> and the poopy plan works. <laughs> it becomes this chain reaction where like one of the security guards busts into the room where all this shit is going down and he gets jumped by the women of the dollhouse and like killed. And then another security guard who's waiting outside is like, huh, he's been in there a while. Guess I better see what's going on. And then he also gets jumped <laughs> and they just keep doing this until all the security guards are out, including Marty. Marty gets fucking murked. And now the Black Widow is completely unprotected. The second that she realizes that all of her security has been taken out and the women of the dollhouse now have their weapons and they're starting to circle her, she's just like, fuck, all right. It's like she doesn't try to fight it or anything. She just knows when she's lost. The women of the dollhouse then proceed to, with like multiple guns pointed at the Black Widow, walk her through the casino in front of everyone. Yet another great moment of characterization for the Black Widow is that even as she's doing this like walk of atonement where she's clearly been had in front of everyone, she's still so proud that she makes a conscious effort to walk like with her head held high as if she's in control of the situation. Even when all hope is lost, she still has that fucking ego. The group of women walk her into the red room, you know, the big murder room where she was sold to Gianni all those years ago. And once the door is locked, they're all kind of just like standing there looking at her. C has the audacity to get an attitude with them. <laughs> and she's just like, all right, so what now, hmm? Well, somebody get me a cigarette. And they do, like they still give her a cigarette. Anyway, in this ending, C's story comes full circle as the women of the dollhouse strap her to the table where she strapped Gianni all those years ago. They do insert mutilation to her and the cherry on top, they peel her skin off. We then jump back to Red, who, like I said, is I think still in the orientation period of being a slave at Shadows. He gets a call on his radio that says like, come to the main entrance right now. He gets there, but instead of being greeted by C, he's greeted by Akari. And she's like, wheel with me. I have something to show you. We see that right in the entrance where Gianni's skin is displayed. Next to him, there's a new skin. That's right, baby. It's the Black Widow. History has fully repeated itself. The big bad management of Shadows Casino has been defeated and replaced by the people who defeated them. Now Akari is in control. And Red is like, why, what the, what does this have to do with me? <laughs> And Akari's like, there's gonna be some changes around here. I'm not freeing you. Like, you don't, you're not free to go, sorry. But how would you like to work for me? And Red is like, tastes like promotion and shakes her hand. And that's how it ends. That's all we learn in this version. A C has been killed. The cycle of violence continues and Red finally has a promotion. Yay. Okay, <coughs> that was a lot. Are you feeling a little overwhelmed? Well, get ready to feel even more overwhelmed because it's time to move on to the other ending. This ending is 10 times more bad shit insane than the first one, but I have such good news for you. Bugs and Dane are back. And just like in the red version, they completely steal the show and make it so that I don't care about any other part of the plot. I just want to see them again. In this ending, Red wins the coin toss. He picks the right color, and as a reward, he is free to go, he gets a billion dollars, and he gets back in time to save his mom. Now, here's where the timelines between two books get a little twisty. In the Red version, when Red won the coin toss, he got back in time to save his mom, and he also killed Bugs and Dane, and then went Rambo and like took out the whole mafia. In the Black version, that doesn't fucking happen happen. He makes it back home in time to save his mom, but in this version he just like gives Bugs and Dane their money and they're like, okay. <laughs> so Bugs and Dane fuck off and leave and Red is left with his mom. 
And his mom is like, oh my gosh, Red, this has been such a scary experience. Where have you been? You're so injured. Why was I left alone with these two Italian men? I'm scared, I'm an old lady. And Red is like, mom, I don't even know where to start explaining this to you. So I'm not gonna explain it to you at all. But I do now have enough money to pay the private investigator to find out where Desi is. What, really? Wait, what private investigator? Oh yeah, sorry, I don't tell you anything. There's a private investigator. I'm trying to find my long lost daughter, your granddaughter, and now I have a billion dollars so I can actually get to the bottom of where she is. Oh my God, you mean I'm really gonna get to see my granddaughter again? Mom, I don't have time for this. I gotta go. <laughs> if you remember, in the red version, red doesn't find Desi, but he does get one crucial piece of information about where she is. And that is that Brittany, his ex-girlfriend, the mother of Desi sold her to a cobbler, um, which of course was a complete left field piece of information because cobbling had not come up or been relevant once in the story, but now apparently one of the most crucial characters to the plot is a cobbler, whatever. We were then informed that in order to find out who the fuck the cobbler is, we would have to read another Aaron Beauregard, Daniel J. Bolt collab book called So Sorry. Oh my fucking God. And you better believe I got my greasy hands on it because I had to fucking know what happened to Desi. So initially I wanted to try to avoid talking about The Cobbler in this review because I wanted to make a separate review on this book and talk about like The Cobbler and everything. But in order to talk about this ending in the black version, it's simply not possible to not spoil massive parts of this book. So. RIP to my potential So Sorry review because I'm gonna have to speed run the whole plot in this just so the ending makes sense. Garrison is this mean, scary, selfish, violent, homeless person. He used to run a cobbler business but as business slowed down, he tried to burn down his place of business for insurance money, not knowing that his entire family was in the building when he did it. Bruh. And they were like planning a surprise birthday party for him. Oh my God. Anyway, his get rich quick scheme didn't work. And now he's a homeless person. He bought Desi basically to like help him beg to look more sympathetic to people who might possibly give him money. But also he bought her to pimp her out. And before you ask, yeah, she's like nine or eight or something. Don't make me think about this. So yeah, Garrison, boo, he's a bad guy. Oh, and one of the things that he did to Desi after buying her was that he cut her lips off and replaced them with a zipper. Like he sewed a zipper onto the skin where her lips used to be. That sounds like a logistical nightmare. So yeah, we get several chapters describing how he and Desi are living in squalor and she's basically like a prisoner to him and he barely feeds her, she's suffering, blah, blah, blah. Her story in this book ends, however, on a slightly hopeful note. There's this whole other character, I, I don't have time to get into it, but, but basically Garrison wants to kill her and is dragging Desi along to make her watch because he's just like, ooh, I'm edgy. And so he brings this other character and Desi to these woods. Turns out it's a very well-known fact that in these woods, there's this pack of feral wild dogs that are bloodthirsty and they just like fucking kill anyone who comes near them. So yeah, Garrison kills this other character with the dogs and in all the chaos, Desi runs away. And Garrison isn't too concerned about her because he's like, she won't make it far. Not with these scary ass dogs in these scary ass woods. Sure enough, Desi gets cornered by these dogs, but instead of killing her, the dogs offer her a piece of meat because they see that she's also a victim of, of humanity's violence. So the story ends with Desi, Red's daughter, becoming the child queen of this pack of feral dogs. And she also has no lips. She ripped the zipper off. So she just has scary teeth. So I don't think you fucking people get it. This dark, gritty psychological drama and a feral child queen, leader of a pack of dogs with no lips Bruh. happen in the same universe. Daniel J. Volt is going to have to connect these two stories together in a way that makes sense. And by God, he does it. <laughs> So Red and this private investigator track down the location of these woods that his daughter is residing in. Him and his private investigator go there in the middle of the night, of course. But what if I told you they weren't the only ones there? In this ending, remember, Bugs and Dane didn't get killed. They got their money and they were sent on their way. But they also are like, we hate Red and we want to kill him anyway. <laughs> So while Red and this private investigator are tromping through the woods, hiding in the bushes are Bugs and Dane, who are working on their plan to jump Red just because they feel like it, just because they think he deserves it. But wait, there's still more. 
What if I told you the Black Widow was here too? <laughs> she was curious about his daughter. And so she and Marty and some of the other security guards are like watching this whole fucking thing go down from a limo on the side of the road. <laughs> so just to make sure we're all on the same page, in the middle of the night, in these woods, we have Red, his private investigator, Desi, a pack of feral dogs, Bugs, Dane, the Black Widow, Marty, and her battalion of mall cops. If you're saying to yourself, wow, this sounds very overly complicated and kind of like a nightmare to read. You're right, <laughs> it is. Just like in the red version, Bugs and Dane are easily the best part of this whole fucking book. We get more golden dialogue between Bugs and Dane. Remember, Bugs and Dane are like hiding in the bushes, planning to jump red. And so they're whispering to each other going over their scheme. Man, Red is such a little bitch. I can't fucking stand that guy. <laughs> You're telling me. It makes no sense how he was able to get all that money in time to pay us back. He's up to something for sure. Oh, for sure. And that's why we are gonna sneak up and jump him and take whatever money he has left. And we're gonna kill him too, right? We also get to beat him and kill him, please? Yeah, of course we get to beat him and kill him. Yes. But remember, the most important part of our plan is that Red doesn't know we're here. So when we go up to beat his ass, we have to be really fucking quiet, okay? Do you think you can handle that? Of course I can fucking handle that. You what, you don't trust me? I'm just saying, sometimes you be clomping around with those big ass fucking boots of yours. Oh, what, like you don't clomp around too? I can be quiet as a mouse. You don't even fucking trust me. Yes, I trust you. We're gonna be fine. Okay, then let's go. Okay, okay, fine. Let's just start sneaking. Stop. What is that? What? That sound. Do you hear that? I didn't hear anything. Let's, let's just keep going. Wait, stop! What? What? What is that fucking sound? There's a sound follow- What? Are you wearing fucking windbreakers? So anyway, back to the actual focus of this ending. Red finally gets reunited with his daughter. He sees Desi, and even though she's wild now, she looks nothing like how he remembers her. He knows it's her, and he wants so badly for her to still be the little girl that he knew all those years ago. And he is trying so hard to be as non-threatening as possible to her. He's like, baby, Desi, it's me, dad. It's, I've, I've come to take you home. And she's like, huh. They stumble over this dialogue, this awkward reunion for a little bit until finally he just like opens his arms to try to hug her. And she like shuffles back at first, but then very slowly starts to crawl over to his arms and he's like weeping. He's like, finally, finally, I, I have my family back. I have my daughter. But in the midst of this teary reunion, Red completely overlooked a very important detail. In fact, Bugs and Dane hiding in the bushes notice this before he does. And that very important detail is that Desi stays fucking strapped, bitch. She has this enormous shard of glass behind her back that Red didn't see. And so as she's going in for this like reunion hug, she steps the fuck out of him. Meanwhile, Bugs and Dane are like, oh, sick. Wait, shouldn't we stop her? Like if she kills Red, then we won't be able to get any more money out of him. Oh fuck, you're so right. Guys, we gotta save Red! <laughs> so as Red is like wriggling on the ground, bleeding out, Bugs and Dane burst from the bushes and they're like, Don't worry, Red, we're here to save you! It's literally Avengers Endgame out in these fucking woods. So Bugs and Dane are like trying to grab at Desi, but she's too fast. And as she's running away, she like sicks her army of wild dogs on them. But of course, Bugs, remember, he's the baseball guy. He has his baseball bat on him and he's like, come and get it, you mutts. So yeah, like Dane has a knife and Bugs has the bat and they're trying to fight off these dogs, but there's so many of them. And remember, these dogs are like known for being super duper violent. And so they take down both of them. I don't even, I am not even going to kind of touch on the details of what I'm about to talk about. There is... There is a sexual bestiality element to this fight. Like one of the dogs, the biggest one, is like sexually active. These dogs are not spayed or neutered. That's all I'm gonna say. I don't wanna fucking think about this anymore. That part is easily the worst part of the whole fucking book. It made me wanna vomit. So anyway, Bugs and Dane die horribly. They're torn to shreds by these dogs in more ways than one. Ugh. Because Bugs and Dane showed up and distracted the whole pack, Red was actually able to escape alive. And he's like, 
damn, thanks guys. Until Desi jumps his ass. And we're never really told what her thought process is, what her motivation is. Um, I guess she's just incapable of trusting people after everything that's been done to her, but she sicks all the dogs on Red and they tear him to shreds. So yeah, RIP my three kings, Bugs, Dane, and Red. You will be missed. So yeah, that's the end is what I would say if there weren't two more players in the game. Remember, the private investigator and the Black Widow are also in the woods or by the woods watching this all go down. So somehow the private investigator is now in the car with the Black Widow and Marty and all those guys and they're all like watching this whole dog fiasco go down. C's attention goes from Red onto Desi and she makes some cryptic ass statements with Marty about how this girl seems like she might be a good fit. And she seems familiar. Marty's even like, you know, she reminds me of someone I know. And him and C are like, tee. <laughs> this ending is just as abrupt and just as vague as the last one. After they like pay off the private investigator and send him on his way, C is looking at Desi and she's like, bring her to me. And Marty and the rest of his crew are like, yes boss. And they go out into the woods. There's a flurry of gunshots and they come out with Desi bound and gagged, throw her into the trunk of the car and close it. And that's how it ends. Both of these endings are so clearly setting up something more. One thing I'll give Daniel J. Volp, he is good at writing a fucking cliffhanger. Even though I didn't like this book as much as the other one, and I found myself frustrated with a lot of the writing choices, with both of these endings, I find myself like foaming at the mouth, begging for more information. We never get a real answer as to if there is like a canonical ending between the two books, because in both books, both endings split off into their own timeline. All four of the endings, are insane in completely different ways. Like I haven't even covered everything that happened in the second version. We also find out that C's Bruh. dad was like alive and kept on life support for all these years. <laughs> Bitch, I don't know. There's so much going on here. And I guess truly my overall review of Through the Eyes of Desperation, the re the <laughs> fuck Through the Eyes of Desperation, the black version is Daniel J. Bulk is great at making interesting characters and writing decent dialogue, but I really think that in future books he should focus on world building, like kind of coming up with like a logistical bible for his stories. I gave similar critiques in my review of the red version where just like Aaron Beauregard, Daniel J. Volk has all these insane big ideas, but if you don't have enough organization to keep them all in line and keep them flowing, then they're not worth anything. They just become a jumbled mess and it's more frustrating than interesting. It's clear that writing interesting characters and backstories comes very easily to Daniel J. Bulb. I don't think he needs to work on that. If I were to give Daniel J. Bulb some free advice, which I'm sure he's just dying to hear from me, I would say he should make it a part of his writing process to sit down and iron out the world building. Even the stuff that like isn't relevant to this book, the stuff that won't come up, the stuff that most readers won't even think about, they'll brush right past it. It's important that you as the author know it because you are the one controlling the canon. Like that shit about the investors, about how there are like way more powerful rich people outside of the casino who are pulling the strings behind the scenes. That was such a good idea! It was brought up and discarded in one page! That drives me fucking insane. This book could have been so good if that had been like woven into it, you know? When you have a potential world, a setting as rich in possibility as Shadow's Casino, to not use that to its fullest extent is fucking criminal. And I feel like he had so many ideas that he wanted to rush through that he rushed right past something that could have been golden. I had a similar problem with his section in So Sorry. Both he and Aaron Beauregard took on half of the story. Daniel J. Volp's section was the part about Garrison. You know, the Garrison, the homeless guy who used to be the cobbler, who burned down his business, who accidentally killed his family, who bought a little girl, who pimps her out, who cut her lips off, who like, you know, there's so much fucking going on there. And it's even more insane because he was trying to get all of this plot, all of these details into this much of the book, this many pages. I just think that his writing would improve exponentially if he slowed down and worked out the creases in the setting, the world of the story he's building. And yeah, a lot of that most readers won't notice or care about at all. 
but I will. Daniel J. Bolt has a passionate audience of people who love to read his work. I bet that they would love to hear more about like the environment surrounding Garrison and this cobbling business he used to have, or hear more about the big evil investors pulling the strings behind Shadow's Casino, you know? Uh, so that's all I have for you today. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you want to. Don't if you don't. I will have a much more lighthearted video coming out much faster than this one. And I'll see you next whenever I upload. Bye! <laughs>